Hi, I'm Michelle at the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine in the children's room. And thank you for joining me for part three of Bunicula, a rabbit tail mystery by Deborah and James Howe and published by Athenaeum Books. Chapter five, Chester goes into his act. The next morning I was awakened by a scream. Robert, Robert, come down here right away. There's something wrong in the kitchen. For a moment, panic seized me. I thought she'd run out of dog food, but then I remembered the events of the previous evening. Mr. Monroe came bounding down the stairs. Chester, Chester, I cried. Did you see Mr. Monroe? His face has turned white. It's Benicula, isn't it? No, he said calmly, it's shaving cream, you idiot. By now, the excitement in the kitchen was at full throttle. The table was covered with Benicula's handiwork. There were white beans and white peas and white squash and white tomatoes and white lettuce and white zucchini. What can it mean, Robert? Mrs. Monroe was saying, I'm getting worried. One tomato is a curiosity, but this is unheard of. There must be something wrong with our refrigerator. That's it, it's turning all the vegetables white. But look, she said, I left these tomatoes on the windowsill and they're white too. And the squash I left in the bowl on the table. At that moment, Pete and Toby came into the kitchen. Holy cow, what's going on? Hey, maybe it's a vegetable blight, mom. Could that be, Robert? Did you ever hear of anything like that? Well, uh, no, actually, this is, uh, I've heard of blight, but nothing like this. Chester leaned my way. This will take forever if we leave it up to them. Sometimes human beings can be so slow. I started to answer him, but he was heading for the table. What about that friend of yours in the agriculture department? Oh, Tom Cragen? Could we call him and ask him if we're doing something wrong? It's DDT, Mom, Peter interjected. I know about this stuff. It's because you buy vegetables that aren't organic. All vegetables are organic, Peter, Mrs. Monroe replied. That's not what my teacher says. See, Toby, I told you this would happen. They're using chemicals on our food, and if you're not careful, you'll turn white too. Like Dad? Robert, couldn't you take the shaving cream off your face? Oh, yes, of course. Where's my towel? I know I brought it down with me. For that matter, where was Chester? I'd see him going toward the table, but I'd lost track of him listening to all the talk about DDT. I just hope they didn't use any of that stuff where they grew chocolate cupcakes. Pete, why did you, did you take my towel? Why would I take your towel, Dad? I don't shave. Just then, the door swung open. I could not believe my eyes. There was Chester with Mr. Monroe's towel draped across his back and tied under his neck like a cape. That was strange enough, but on his face was an expression that sent chills down my spine. His eyes were wide and staring. The corners of his mouth were pulled back in an evil grimace. His teeth were bared and gleaming in the morning light. He cackled menacingly and threw back his head as if he were laughing at all of us. I thought he'd completely lost his mind. There's my towel. What's the matter with Chester? Were you cold? Mr. Monroe bent down to take the towel from Chester. Before he could lay his hands on it, Chester flipped over onto his back, closed his eyes, and folded his paws over his chest. It was a hideous sight. He opened his eyes wide with paws outstretched. He slowly lifted his head, his eyes glazed and vacant. Soon the upper half of his body followed all in one smooth flow until he was sitting in a sitting position. Hey dad, did you leave your brandy glass out last night? Chester's acting a little weird. Well son, cats are funny creatures. I glanced at Chester. He wasn't laughing. Psst, Chester, what are you up to? I'm a vampire, you dolt. Can't you tell? I'm trying to warn them. Well, it's not working. You'd better think of something else. Chester frowned, apparently deep in thought. So you see, Toby, Mr. Monroe was explaining, all cats are as individual as all people. Maybe he just wants to get our attention. Isn't that right, kitty cat? Ordinarily, Chester would have left the room upon being called Kitty Cat, but he was lost in thought. Come on, Chester, give me back my towel, Mr. Monroe. Move toward Chester. Chester's eyes lit up, and here's Chester warning them about Benicula. 
Chester's eyes lit up. He looked up at me and smiled. I sensed I was not going to like what he had in mind. I was toying with the notion of slinking under the table when Chester fixed me with his eyes. How deep they were, like black pools. I felt myself floating, lost in them, my will no longer my own. I felt an inexplicable urge to murmur, yes, master, when he walked slowly, steadily toward me. As he drew nearer, I found myself unable to move. He stopped before me, never taking his gaze from me and lunged. Yow! Mom, Chester bit Harold on the neck. Aw, that wasn't a real bite, was it, Chester? That was a love bite. Isn't that cute? Love bite, my foot, that hurt. Chester, what's the matter with you, I sputtered. Do I look like a tomato? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway, Harold. They don't understand. How can human beings read the same books I do and still be so thick? Our conversation was interrupted. Mrs. Monroe picked Chester up and cuddled him. I was praying she would not add insult to injury by kissing his nose, which he hates more than anything. Poor Chester, do you need a little love? Do you know what I'm going to do to, do to do? You big ball of fuzz, you. Oh, oh, I could tell what was coming. I'm going to kiss you on your little nose. Yep, I could tell that was coming all right. Chester knew better than to resist. He went limp in Mrs. Monroe's arms. Mr. Monroe took his towel off Chester. I still don't know why he's wearing my towel, he said. I think he must be cold, dear. Here's your towel. Why don't you get his kitty sweater? Chester looked ill, and he can wear that all day. As Chester was being buttoned into his bright yellow sweater with little purple mice in cowboy hats all over it, Mr. Monroe said, what about those vegetables? Shall I speak to Tom Cragen? Yes, dear, Mrs. Monroe said. Why don't you? I'm sure there's some explanation. In the meantime, I'll change markets. To tell the truth, I'm really much more worried about Chester. We'd better keep an eye on him. Chester and I did not speak until late afternoon. I was busy nursing my neck and Chester was busy hiding under the sofa, too embarrassed to be seen. When we did speak at last, it was a brief exchange. Hey Chester, I called when he finally crawled out from under. We don't have to worry about any vampire bunnies anymore. All you have to do is stand outside his cage in that sweater and he'll laugh himself to death. Chester was not amused. That's right, make fun all of you. No one understands. I tried to warn them and they wouldn't heed and now I'm going to take matters into my own hands whereupon Chester and his 16 purple mice went into the kitchen for dinner. And here's a picture of Chester with the sweater with the mice on it, if you can see that. He doesn't look very happy. Harold helps out. That night, I had an uneasy sleep. Strange noises emanated from downstairs. It sounded like toenails clicking back and forth on the floor. It must be Benicula making his midnight run, I thought, although I'd never known him to make a sound, and I, I smelled the funniest odor in the air, something familiar, though I couldn't place it. As the night progressed, it grew stronger and stronger until finally it tickled my nose and I sneezed myself awake. I jumped off Toby's bed, still sniffling, and headed down the stairs for the living room to find Chester to see if he could smell it too. The odor grew even stronger as I approached the living room. Standing in the doorway was Chester, a strange pendant hanging from his neck. Phew, Chester, I said, what are you wearing that awful thing for? It smells. Of course it smells, he replied. Here, I made one for you too, put it on. Are you kidding? That thing smells like garlic. It is garlic, Chester stated matter of factly. Why are you wearing garlic, I asked thinking that by this time, Chester, Chester was capable of anything. As we walked into the living room, I tripped on another piece of garlic lying in the doorway. Careful, Chester said, watch your step. I surveyed the room and saw that it was strewn with garlic on the doorways, over the windows, and around Benicula's cage. The poor little fellow had buried his nose as far as possible under his blanket. I was about to follow his example and return to Toby's bed and bury my nose under the blankets when Chester grabbed my tail with his teeth. 
You're not leaving this room until you put this on, he grumbled at me. I think that's what he said. I wasn't sure because he had my tail in his mouth. It's not polite to talk with your mouth full, Chester. Drop that tail. Meanwhile, meanwhile, my eyes were beginning to water. And here is Chester and Harold. Listen, Chester snapped at me, fortunately letting go of my tail first. The book said to use garlic. What book, I said, The Joy of Cooking? Chester continued, The Mark of the Vampire says garlic renders vampires immobile. What does that mean? It means they can't go anywhere if there's garlic around. Well, I've got news for you, Chester. I can't go anywhere either. The smell is killing me, but you've got to put it on. It says so in the book. If you don't put it on, I'll put it on for you. Do Chester, I said as my nose suddenly and involuntary closed. I'm leaving this room right now. And I did. All right, that is the end of part three of Benecula. A Rabbit Tale Mystery by Deborah and James Howe. I'm Michelle with the Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine in the Children's Room, and I hope you join me next time for part four of Vernicula.